I'm 20 years old and I work at my town's local Ikea in Texas. Since I don't go to school during daytime, my boss put me on an overnight shift after the store closed at 11pm. This means that I was working from 11 to roughly about 1am. I was basically a glorified janitor, going around the store, mopping the floor and cleaning and tidying whatever people used to touch or sit around in the furniture and concept rooms throughout the day. Given that IKEA was a super center, there would still be a number of employees working during after hours, but for some reason that night, uh, I was one of only like two other people going around the store to clean. It was around midnight and I was just dusting off some of the shelves in one of the concept living rooms when I heard someone's footsteps echoing in the distance behind me. This was odd as the store was closed over an hour ago and no one was supposed to still be in the store's premises. But I just sort of brushed it off as it was probably my co-worker Carlos going around and doing his part. Though it would be somewhat unusual for him to do that, given that we basically never see each other while we're cleaning, but because the store is so big and we're assigned to clean our own areas of the store each time. So I brushed it off and some time passed. I had eventually made my way to the children's bed section of the store. It wasn't my favorite part of the store because it was always so badly lit from the broken lamps overhead. I was making the beds when I noticed movement in the far corner of my field of vision. It was faint, like something ducking under one of the beds. I started to get pretty anxious by this point, because I just remembered the footsteps from earlier and connected the dots a bit. Something was definitely off, and I realized that there's a high chance I'm not alone in this part of the storm. I looked around, but obviously there was nothing. As much as I had my suspicions too, I started to wonder if my mind just made up what I just saw or something. A couple of minutes passed and I was still very much on guard. And that's when I heard a plastic cup hit the floor about a block away. It came from one of the kitchen rooms in the kitchen section which was the last section that I had to clean before I was done for the night. I stopped what I was doing and looked into the direction of the sound. All I saw was a cup in the middle of the alleyway. But that definitely made it real. My fight or flight started kicking in pretty intensely at this point as I tried to make sense of what the heck was going on. I started to think that maybe someone was messing with me. Either my coworker or some random kids were playing some sort of a prank to scare me. However, my coworker Carlos isn't the type to joke around. We barely talk either way, but I figured whoever was doing this was just trying to lure me in towards the cup. I decided to call out Carlos's name and nothing. I told him that if it was a prank that he should stop right now. During that moment I was almost practically sure that it was a joke too and walked towards the cup to pick it up. Once I was there though I noticed that one of the cupboards underneath the sink from the concept kitchen was slightly left open. My imagination was running wild at this moment so I slowly walked towards the cupboard and opened it completely to see if anybody was inside. And that's when I saw a sickly looking man staring right at me. I immediately backed off a couple of feet away and he was still staring right at me with those creepy white eyes and a sickly smile. He wasn't saying anything, just making very creepy eye contact with me, which was probably the scariest part of this whole thing. After about five long traumatizing seconds of this, I was creeped out enough and ran to the nearest exit as fast as I could, leaving all of my cleaning equipment behind. I went home and tried my best to forget about what had just happened, but I just couldn't get the image of this creepy guy's face out of my head. The next day, I called my boss to tell him what happened last night, and he was obviously taken aback and told me that he was going to go check that area for signs of someone. And he called me back later in the day to tell me that they'd found crumbs of chips and cinnamon roll boxes in that cupboard, but nothing else. Ever since, I've kept working there and we never again found traces of anyone living in the store. Even though I'm over it now and come to realize that it was probably just a homeless man, I still can't get that haunting image of this guy's creepy face out of my head. Nor can I make sense of that cup falling over 
for a reason. Ron Erickson was weird, vulgar, and broken, like many men can be in the military. We knew that he had a, a sordid past, and we knew his upbringing was strange to say the least, but he seemed like a harmless man. My husband, Ben, went to the same post boot camp school as this guy. He and a handful of boys were bonded by the terrible conditions and even more terrible higher-ups while attending school. Ben married me while on leave. We've been together a long time and know each other much longer than that. Eventually, we moved into an apartment together at his duty station in Southern California. And it was wonderful. Ron would come around occasionally and spend weekends with Ben. Sometimes he even slept in our home on the sofa or on the air mattress in the living room. Eventually, we moved to a larger house on the military base and Ron had to be deployed to Japan. It was a long six months too, let me tell you. But life went on normally without him. Friends came and went. This isn't unique. Eventually though, it was Ben's turn to deploy. It was hard to cope, but it was okay. We said our goodbyes and we smooched a bit and he was off to strengthen his sea legs for the next six months. When Ron came back to California, one week after Ben deployed, he wanted to pick up a box of his things from our home that we had tucked away for safekeeping for him. To be honest too, I was sort of excited to see the familiar face. He picked up his things, shared some small talk, and then he left. Nothing strange at all, honestly. Knowing that he was back from his journey and many of his friends were deployed with Ben, I extended some kind and friendly words over Facebook Messenger occasionally, Wishing him well and just being polite. Unfortunately for both of us though, he mistook my kindness as romantic gestures. Now one night at about 2am, Ron called me via Facebook's calling feature. Concerned for him, I answered, I, I thought the worst. Had he become depressed or maybe he was suicidal? I can't in good conscience deny a listening ear to someone who maybe needed it especially someone my husband is somewhat fond of. The conversation started somewhat normal too, as normal as a strange, unwarranted 2am call could be. He was loud, possibly drunk, and sounded desperate for conversation. He rambled on for a while and then admitted to me that as a child, he had actually had a sexual relationship with his younger stepsister. He ended up talking in a lot of circles too, but a few moments that stood out for me were... I just can't trust myself around women, especially alone. I've always liked you. I think that you're hot and I remember the way you looked in your bikini at the beach. During this conversation that I should have hung up on, I made several attempts to keep the content friendly and uplifting, assuming that he was just having some sort of an episode. It was all horrible and made me feel disgusting. He then told me though that he was near my house at another girl's house, I assume with some poor guy's awful cheating wife. He said that she wasn't really anything to him and he wanted to come over to my house. He knew Ben was an ocean away and that I was alone in my house, so I told him not to come and he hung up with me. I sort of panicked and closed all the first floor windows and doors, making sure that they were all locked. I turned off the lights as well. I took my dog and my cat up to my bedroom and I locked the door, wedging pieces of furniture into the door to create a sort of barricade of sorts. And... Yeah, he actually showed up. He walked around my house, pulling on the doors, calling my phone, messaging me horrible things. I screamed for him to leave, both on the phone and through my upstairs window. It was truly a nightmare realized. He messaged me. I could get in if I really wanted to. A clear threat, in my opinion. I called the police, and then I called my neighbor, a big Navy doc who I felt I owed my life to. And after being chased off by Hunter, my neighbor, and having long talks with PMO, NCIS, and my neighbors, I received a protection order against Ron. I'm disappointed that there wasn't any break time for him, but I was pleased that I have documented evidence in case he ever tries to contact me or my husband again. I guess it just goes to show that you never really truly know someone. Please stay safe out there, guys, and always exercise your right to bear arms if you so choose.
Oh, and uh, yes, my husband is well aware of what happened too. I was able to call him that night, and he also spoke to the police and gave them all of his ex-friend's information, so he was under arrest the following morning. My husband and I have been to counselling together, and separately too because of the incident, all provided by the USMC. I still take Zol off to sort of cope with the mental toll this interaction took on me. It was also a few years ago now, and we've since moved back to our home state in the Midwest, living happily and safely near family. We were well supported too in this time by so many great marines, sailors, chaplains, law enforcement, and even some medical staff. So, we were safe, but still, things like this, they really do just take a toll on you. All I can say is that I'm really glad that I took him seriously and locked the doors that night. When I was 15, I was going to a school that was back to back with the town cemetery. There was even a small passage to it. It was near the school's football field and people may need to access the cemetery for reasons that you'll understand in a minute. And in my country, you can be enrolled in a school in any of the three shifts, morning, afternoon or evening. I was enrolled at night. Now one night, during physical education class, we were playing football and the ball ended up in the cemetery. It was almost time to go home and my group started an argument about who would have to go and get the ball. But me, being kind, wanting the discussion to end soon and since I was not afraid, unlike many of those involved, I go off to the cemetery. I go to the passage to the cemetery, open the little gate and squeeze through it. The gate is big enough for me to just crouch through. One of my colleagues was in charge of holding the gate open, but when I passed through the gate, he closed it and started laughing. But as the cemetery was well lit, I didn't think too much of it, except that he was doing something childish. The ball was about 15 meters from the gate though, so I casually walked over to it and picked it up. When I looked forwards, I saw one of the most bizarre things in my entire life. A man was lying on top of a granite tomb, while another was taking a dump on his bare chest. I froze, because, I mean, what the heck, right? I turn around and I just start walking to the gate, pretending like I saw nothing, and while I walked the 15 meters, I began to hear steps behind me. I turned to look, and the two adult men were now walking towards me. I arrive at the gate and call my friend, telling him to open it, but all I hear is laughter in the distance, but probably near the class block. I call even louder, and a girl who heard me opens the gate, but in the meantime, the two men arrive to me. One grabs my jacket by the sleeve and starts to drag me. I looked at the girl when they started pulling me, and she made a horrified face and closed the gate. I thought that she was going to call the teacher or alert someone. I expected her to go, but... After 5 or 10 seconds, I realized that she was just pretending that nothing was happening and I was alone with these two degenerates in a cemetery after 10 p.m. They dragged me near to the grave where I saw them and one of them, a drunk guy, started talking in a drunk voice. And he said, what did you see? I said, I didn't see anything. And he was like, come on, what did you see? I said that I didn't see anything again, I swear. And the drunk guy at this point starts to get violent, still holding me by my jacket sleeve, pulls me closer and speaks in a more serious tone, before he seemed to be sort of kidding. And he says, say it once, what did you see? Me, not knowing what to do, I say, I saw him taking a dump on your chest. The other guy looked like a, a drug dealer. He had all the red flags that a drug dealer would have. And when I said that he was doing this on the drunk guy's chest, he pulled a knife on me. It wasn't a small one too. It was only a little less than the length of his forearm. I instantly began to shake and he started talking while pointing at me with his free hand. The guy taking the dump says, I remember your face and if anyone finds out what happened, I'll find you and I'll cut you to pieces. I was so scared that the only thing that I managed to gather courage for was to mumble something about going back to school and I promised that I'll never say anything about any of it. They let me go, but in no time did they put the knife on me. I went back to the gate and once again called for someone to open it. 
My colleague, who closed the gate on me for the first time, was the one who opened it. I instantly punched him in the face. He fell down, put his hand on his face, and asked why. And I said, you should have opened the gate. And I walked away, delivered the ball, and I went to the classroom to gather my things. When leaving school, there was easily two to three hundred students leaving at the same time, parents picking up their children at school, but I lived two kilometers away, and so I used to walk home. It wasn't really a dangerous place, and we never heard of any case of crime being committed with a student or anything. I was still completely terrified, obviously, of what had happened to me, but I couldn't tell anyone. On a normal day, the first part of the walk home was fun. I walked part of the way with four of my friends, and on the way we would play and talk, but they lived between 800 meters to a kilometer from the school on the same street, so I kind of delivered them to their respective homes in a sequence and then walked the rest of the distance. Again, on a normal day, that kilometer alone was no big deal. The way home was generally well lit, and I passed busy places, sometimes bought a snack at those places, but on that day... I just wanted to leave, and I walked with my friends over to their house, barely participating in the conversation, which was unusual, and started my little one kilometer journey home. Now, I don't know if anyone else can say that they've already felt it, but there is something different about when we're scared, but we're just more alert, right? On the way home to my house, I passed three bars and a church, and the rest of the way was on a street that had a soccer field on the corner and a nursery afterwards both closed at the time obviously so that was definitely the worst part of the way home i'm passing in front of the nursery just after passing the football field when i hear the sound of footsteps stepping on leaves then on concrete then leaves again alternating in a pattern there were parts of the sidewalk that had concrete floor and others that were just dirt and leaves again though when we're scared we are way more aware of everything and I ended up realizing that someone was walking where I had just walked. They were the same sounds that I had heard a few seconds ago and it was almost like deja vu. I look back and you can probably guess that the two men are walking very fast towards me. I don't even think this time and I'm running at full speed before I know it. Not in the direction of my house but just straight ahead. I run a block and arrive at the border of the city. My house was near the end of the city. I make a turn to the left and this time I start heading home. There are still three small blocks to my house and when I look back again, they are running after me. I start to stumble because the street was not paved and I almost fall, but this is enough for them to start reaching me. I turn left again, this time on the street that I live in. I reach my gate and it's unlocked. I go in and barely close the gate back, but when I get to my door, they're trying to open the gate. I go in and lock the door, but they open the gate by this time, and then they start walking around my house. I take out my cell phone, and I start calling the police immediately. My mum starts to panic without knowing what's going on. My sister, who was already asleep, wakes up. My brother leaves his room to ask what's going on. I explain between breaths that basically the two men started running after me, and that I'm calling the police, and that they're in the yard. As I call the police, I look out the window and see one of the men. It's the drunk guy. I panic even more. The 911, not the actual number here, obviously. A guy starts to talk to me and asks what's going on. I start feeding him info and while I'm speaking to him, the other guy started trying to kick the back door open. But luckily, it was a very sturdy door with multiple locks and he couldn't do anything to it. I start to talk to the operator to send someone soon. There are people in my house and I think they want to kill me. He tells me that when I told him the situation and the place that he had already sent a vehicle and what I needed to do now was when the police arrived to help them. So I start describing the drunk guy who is the only one that I see. I start walking around my house trying to see the other through the window. I catch a glimpse of him and immediately knew who it was. I give the description that I remember from the cemetery. Luckily, I actually lived near a prison, so there were always police cars nearby, and in less than five minutes, they were at my house. Both guys tried to jump over the wall to the neighbor who lived behind me. The police followed them and actually managed to catch them, but somehow they escaped. 
I heard they found them later somewhere else and that he was questioned by the police and then let go because of lack of evidence or something. But the guy that was actually taking the dump ended up in jail for trespassing on private property and also illegal possession of a gun. Apparently he had a 22 revolver and the knife with him as well. The police said that he had actually used some hard drugs. The story about the cemetery got to everyone eventually that I knew and about a year later I found through a not law abiding friend that the dude was actually killed because of a rebellion that happened in prison which is 10 blocks away from my house. To this day I can honestly say that I've never been so scared in my life. I still live in the same house but by myself my family moved out and I'm still pretty afraid that someday that drunk guy is going to try and get revenge on me or something. Anyway, I know it's a bit of a weird and sort of random story. I know it's pretty disturbing as well but it actually happened and I sure hope that I never see that guy again. This is something that my sister experienced about a week ago, which was similar to an experience that a friend of hers had about a month before. So she was sleeping at her boyfriend's house, which backs onto a mountain with a forest starting in his backyard, when she decided to go and get herself some food from upstairs. Her boyfriend refused to go with her as he had school in the morning and it was already one in the morning. His room is in the basement, so she went up the stairs to the kitchen on the same level as the rest of the family's bedrooms. Because she didn't want to wake everyone else up, she just used her phone flashlight while she kind of prepared herself bananas and hummus and whatnot. And while doing this, she what sounded like large dog footsteps, but they don't have any pets, going to the bathroom, which she recognized as it was kind of squeaky. The door opened and closed about three or four times before finally closing, then the footsteps progressed down the hall in her direction to a closet door where the same thing happened. Only this time, the door was left open. She tried to brush it off as just a family member and went back to chopping her banana. But out of the corner of her eye, she saw what appeared to be a very large black figure slowly lean its way around the hallway corner to look down into the kitchen. She looked up and it pretty quickly disappeared. The same thing happened again, only this time its neck stretched out longer to get a better look at her. She looked up again and caught a glimpse of something with white glowing eyes before it disappeared back around the corner again. At this point, she was freaked out and grabbed a knife. She quickly went around the corner to turn on the light, but there was no one there, and so she gathered all of her stuff and headed back downstairs. When she told her boyfriend in the morning, he told her that that closet door is not just a closet door, but it's an empty room with an attic door in the ceiling. They went in the room the next day and found that the paint had been scratched off of the attic door and the floor was scratched to pieces beneath it. A friend of hers had a similar incident a month or so earlier when he was taking a leak in the backyard. He looked up to see a tall creature with what he described to be white glowing eyes and huge teeth standing amongst the trees. Once it noticed him, it ran off, but then started coming after him once he started running back towards the house. She's not entirely sure what it was, but whatever it was, she really hopes to never meet it. <laughs> 